So this evening we are beginning our study on the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Something I'm sure many of y'all have gone through before, you've studied before, but I think it's helpful whenever we begin studying a historical document like this, something that is close to 400 years old, that we, um, that we look at the history of it, that we look at the context of it. Because we do not receive this catechism from nowhere. There is a bunch of history behind it. There's a whole context behind it. There's, in fact, there's a civil war behind this catechism, behind the confession of faith. And so it's good for us to look at the context of it, the history behind it, before we come to study it, so that we can understand what was in the minds of the writers, so we can understand the context of it all. Um, so I'll get started here with a bit of a question. Does anybody know what this is? Aware this is? Hmm? That's right, that's right. You'll get a piece of candy from my office later. That's Westminster Abbey. Westminster Abbey is where the Westminster Assembly was held. Some of you, if you've been watching any of the, the Queen's funeral from the past couple of weeks, you've seen Westminster Abbey. This is a picture of the inside of during the Westminster, it's not a picture, it's a, it's a, it's a painting. They didn't have pictures back then. It's a painting, it's a famous painting of uh, inside a deliberation during the Westminster Assembly. The Westminster Assembly took place from 1643 to 1652 at Westminster Abbey in London. It took place during the First English Civil War. We'll get to the context of that in a little bit. But just some historical backgrounds. How do we get to 1643 and the calling of the Westminster Assembly? How do we get there? It starts with this man right here. You all know him as Martin Luther, 1483 to 1546. He, so he's given credit for starting the, the um, Protestant Reformation in 1517 when he nailed those 95 theses to the door in Wittenberg. He began kind of the avalanche of questioning the Roman Catholic Church, which was the church at the time. There's only one church, the Roman Catholic Church. You didn't have any options. You didn't have New Covenant Presbyterian Church. You didn't have the Presbyterian Church downtown, as it's been referred to me a couple of times. You didn't have all these options. You had one church, Roman Catholic Church. And when Martin Luther nailed those 95 theses on the door of the church in Wittenberg and he started that, that Protestant Reformation, a whole avalanche of things began happening. One of those things that happened involved this man. Does anybody know who this is? King Henry. King Henry. That's two pieces of candy. For, there you go. <laughs> king Henry VIII. He was the king of England. He was the king of England from uh, 1509 to 1547. He was married, uh, first, his first marriage was to his brother's wife. His brother passed away, and he was forced to marry his brother's wife, Catherine of Aragon. Catherine could not provide him with a male heir, which was a problem for Henry. He wanted to have a male heir. The Catholic Church at the time did not allow him to get a divorce, so he had a problem. He sent an emissary named, uh, named um, his name was Thomas Kramer. He sent Thomas Kramer to negotiate with the Pope. I can't, I, I can't have a male heir, I, I, the Catherine of Aragon is not working out, and the Pope said no. And that wasn't good enough for Henry VIII. So he began the process of seceding from the Roman Catholic Church. It had never been done before. 1534, the act of succession, or succession, which was the, the formal start of the English Protestant Reformation. So in the act of succession, Henry VIII had the audacity to say, Pope, you are not the head of the church anymore in England. I, as the king of England, am now head of the church. And that was the beginning of the Anglican church, the Church of England, where now the crown was the head of the church, not the pope. Henry divorced Catherine of Aragon. He married somebody named Anne Boleyn. And at that point, once the uh, English Reformation was starting, that Thomas Kramer, who was the first archbishop of Canterbury, you might have heard that term, the archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Kramer was the first, he began the process of reforming the church in England. He wanted it to look more and more like the church on the continent, the churches in Germany where Martin Luther was leading the church, the churches 
over in Switzerland where Calvin was beginning to lead. He wanted the church in England to look like the churches over in the continent. So he began that, that um, process of reformation. But Henry died in 1547. His son, through Anne Boleyn, was somebody named King Edward VI. From 1547 to 1553, he was only king for six years. He died really young. He was only king for six years. And so then the, the throne was handed over to his stepsister, Queen Mary. Anybody know the nickname for Queen Mary? It was Bloody Mary. Different Mary. Same name, different Mary. Bloody Mary was the first daughter, we'll go back a couple slides, of Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon. So she was skipped over for the throne. Her mom was cast out of the kingdom, but then she becomes queen. And do you think that she was happy when she became queen? <laughs> she was not happy with the Reformation. She was not happy with what was going on, and so she decided to bring it all back the other way. Now England's going to be Catholic again. That means all the structures that she put in place, all the people who were in place, had to go. Hundreds of people were burned at the stake. That's why she's called Bloody Mary. Thomas Kramer, the first, um, the first Archbishop of Canterbury, he was burned at the stake during the rule of Queen Mary. But she only lived for five years as the queen. She was only the queen for five years. She did a lot of damage in that five years, but she was only the queen for five years. After she passed away, Queen Elizabeth became queen. She was the sister of King Edward. She was known as the Virgin Queen. She reigned for 46 years. She was never married. She never had any kids. And during her reign, it was a Protestant nation. England was a Protestant nation, but she began developing a hierarchical structure in the church, continuing what her, um, her father would have done, which was the crown and the episcopacy as the head of the church. It was more hierarchical. And during her reign, there were people known as the Puritans and the Presbyterians who didn't like that. They didn't think that the, that the king or the queen or the crown should have anything to, to do with the church. They wanted more freedom for the religious authorities. They wanted the church to be able to determine the way that it was run. They wanted the church and the ministers to be able to establish what the theology was and the structure was of the church. But Queen Elizabeth wasn't really for that. So she advocated more for those hierarchical structures. She advocated more for the, the crown being the head of the Church of England. After she passed away in 1603, she died childless and husbandless, so they didn't know what to do. They had to have a different family become the, the royalty. They had, a different family had to take the crown. From Scotland, King James I became king. James was raised a Presbyterian, in Scotland, but when he came to the throne in England, he continued to advocate not for Presbyterianism, not for the Puritan movement, but again for more of the hierarchical structure where the Presbyterians and the Puritans began to be more and more persecuted by the, by the, by the crown. You know King James because he authorized the King James version of the Bible. During his reign, that's when the persecution of the Puritans ramped up. It was during the reign of King James that the Mayflower sailed over to the U.S. The Puritans who were seeking to escape the, the oppression of King James and the British crown. After he died, King Charles, his son, who was less politically savvy, King Charles was not quite as persuasive. He wasn't really a very good diplomat. He, he had all of the sensitivity of an anvil. That's the way that he reigned. And so his, during his reign, the persecution of the Puritans and the Presbyterians, it really came to a head. Until in, in 1640, the English Civil War began. Because King Charles was continuing to persecute the Scottish Presbyterians to the north. He was continuing to persecute the English Puritans around him until they just had about had enough of it. Because the parliament who was in charge, they are mostly Puritans. And King, Char and King Charles was trying to control them and to tell them what to do, and they, they, did, they had enough of it. 
So they revolted. Eventually, King Charles was arrested. He lost the war. He was beheaded. He was killed. And it was during that civil war, it was during the English Civil War, that the Westminster Assembly was called. Because during the English Civil War, they didn't know who was in charge. Who was in charge of the church? The king is gone. There's a civil war. Who are we going to be? What do we believe? Who's going to structure the church? So the Westminster Assembly was called. Hundreds of pastors, theologians, and professors, they gathered in Westminster Abbey over the course of nine years, and they, they gathered together for the purpose of shoring up the, the Christian faith in England. They wanted to settle the government and the liturgy of the church. How are we going to worship? How are we going to be governed? They wanted to clarify the doctrine, the theology of the church. What do we believe? And they wanted to provide a theological foundation for generations to come by way of a confession of faith and catechisms. That's where we got the confession of faith and catechisms that came out of this assembly over nine years. These hundreds of men gathered to put this together for the good of the church during a time of political and religious upheaval. And this is how we got the Westminster Shorter Catechism. This is a um, publication here, the, one of the first Westminster Shorter Catechisms. That's how we got it, and that's how we got the catechism. But what is it? What is a catechism? It comes from the Greek word catechesis, which means instruction by the word of mouth. Catechisms have been around since the Christian faith has been around. The first catechism was uh, first, way back in the first century A.D. The first catechism was the Didache. It's an ancient document that lays out what the Christian faith is and what we believe. Instruction by the word of mouth. That's catechesis. It's questions and answers that form the foundation of our faith, the foundation of the Christian religion. That's a lot of historical background. There's not going to be a test at the end. I promise you that. But that's just the background to get us to the point of why catechisms are important. You've just seen the result of what happens when people don't know what they believe, what their foundation is. It's years and years of political upheaval, religious upheaval, civil war, all sorts of problems. So why are catechisms important? I want us to look together at a scripture that helps us understand that. Colossians 1, 21-23. If you have a Bible, you can turn there. If not, we have it right here. Handy dandy on the screen for you. Look at that. And I want you to pay a special attention here to the, uh, to the red and bold version. This is why catechisms and catechesis and having that foundation is important. Colossians 1, 21-23, where it says, And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable, and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. So why is catechesis important? A man named Thomas Watson, he, picks up on, he, picks, he, he, um, he picked up on that verse, Colossians 1, 21 through 23, he picked up especially on that bold statement right here, if indeed you continue in the faith, Stable and steadfast, not shifting. Having a foundation, having catechisms is important if we're to remain stable and steadfast. Not shifting from the hope of the gospel. He has some other 
great things to say about this. I'd recommend his book. If you want some additional study materials, I have some laid out on that uh, table right there. Don't take them. They're mine. But um, you can look at them, and I would love to order them for you if you want some additional study materials. His, his book, in particular, A Body of Divinity, is a very good study resource that I'm going to lean on heavily for this study. But he had this to say, Thomas Watson, he had this to say in that book, It is the duty of Christians to be settled in the faith, such as are not settled in religion, such as are not settled in the faith, will at one time or another prove wandering stars. They don't stay in the same place. They will lose their former steadfastness and wander from one opinion to another. And don't we see that nowadays? (laughs) Everybody has a church. Everybody has a set of beliefs. Everybody has their own particular interpretation. But what do we believe? How do we stay steadfast? How do we not be led astray? That's what Paul encourages the Ephesians with in Ephesians 4, 11-14. This is what he says to that Ephesian church. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children. If you all were here on Sunday night, you saw my son Benjamin. What was he doing? He was everywhere. Here, there, in the hallways, down the other hallways. He was all over the place. We don't want to be like children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. No, we want to be mature, right? We don't want to be carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. But rather, we want to be settled. We want to be settled and steadfast and immovable. And a statement of our faith like a catechism, is a very helpful tool that God has given us for that, which summarizes what the Bible teaches for us, an easy-to-remember, easy-to-work-through theology. This is kind of where I'll finish us with us here tonight. Thomas Watson, in his book, he gives us, in his introduction, the importance of catechisms and how catechisms can help us be settled and why being settled... That's the term that he used, being settled, being steadfast, immovable, is important. Why we need that as the church? Why is that important? Five reasons. First, he says that being settled is the great end of preaching. Meaning this, that when we come to church to sit under the Word of God, as the people of God, His Word is to settle into our soul and to make us steadfast. Uh, Jeremiah 23-29 says that that the Word of God is like a hammer. A hammer that hammers in the nail, the Word of God into our soul so that we're, we're secure. Second, he says that being settled brings honor and glory to God. As we grow in our faith and as we're steadfast and immovable, as we know what we believe, and people ask us questions... We have answers. We don't just send people away without knowing what we believe. If someone asks us, what, is, what does it mean to be forgiven? I heard that word justification. What does that mean? What does it mean to be saved? What does it mean when you say that God is provident? What, what are these Ten Commandments? What are, the, what are the Ten Commandments teach? Why are the Ten Commandments important? It's important to have answers for that so that we can glorify God and be able to give witness to what we believe. Here's another important one. Number three, being settled prepares us for suffering. That as we suffer, as we deal with difficulty, we're not surprised and we don't run away from it. There are a lot of Christians, as we just saw in the 17th century, that being a Christian and being a Reformed Christian cost them their lives. It cost Thomas Kramer, the first Archbishop of Canterbury, his life. Being settled prepares us for temptation, for, for suffering. Thomas Watson puts it this way. He says that 
unsettled Christians do not consult what is best or biblical. They consult what is safest. So if you're unsettled and you're just tossed to and fro by the waves, whenever persecution comes, whenever the least bit of difficulty comes, what are you going to do? You're going to fold. You're going to do what's safe. But being settled and having an assurance of what we believe, it prepares us for suffering. It prepares us for temptation, he goes on to say. Romans 16, 16 through 18 says that we should watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you've been taught, that we should avoid them. And it goes on to say, For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites, and by smooth talk, and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. Paul's talking about people in and around Christendom who by smooth talk and flattery deceive the hearts of the naive. Being settled and being founded on the Word of God, it prepares us for that temptation. It prepares us as we face the temptation to fold, as we face the temptation to compromise doctrine. It used to be the the case, the generation or two ago, that being a Christian was convenient. It was the thing to do. It's where you found your friends. It's where you found your people to play cards with. It it was your social club. It was was a convenient thing to do. In a generation, it's no longer going to be convenient to be a Christian. The things that we believe... (laughs) are so contrary to our culture. And so, being settled and knowing what what we believe is going to help us prepare for the temptation and for the suffering to come. And number five, and perhaps the most important, if you are not settled, you will never grow. Is there anybody in here who does farming or gardening or anything like that? What's important to a plant? Water, fertilizer, roots. It needs to have roots that go down into the ground, deep roots. The bigger the tree, the deeper the roots. A tree and a plant and something that's alive needs to be rooted in something to be able to grow. That's the parable that Christ told, the parable of the soil. The seed that fell on shallow soil. It did not grow. Why did it not grow? Because it had no root. If you find yourself not growing as a Christian, if you find yourself not growing in your depth of love for Christ or perhaps in the the fruit of the Spirit, if you find yourself not growing, perhaps there's no root there. And we need to find where the root is found. And we we find our root in the Gospel of Jesus Christ found in His Word that begins to transform our hearts by His Word and Spirit. There's no other route to be found. Thomas Watson puts it this way. I should just read his book because really he can teach his class better than I can. But he said, you can no more grow in godliness if you're unsettled than a bone can grow in the body that is out of joint. So imagine a bone trying to grow that's out of joint and broken. It's not going to be, it's not going to grow until it's set until it's fixed, until it's in the right place. Growing as a Christian begins by being settled, by, being, by having a deep root in God's Word. And so that's why we come to study this little catechism. It's not because we just like theology. It's not because we just want to inform our minds. It's not because we find it interesting. It's because we need it. There is intensely practical doctrine to be found in this catechism. It's not just for our minds. It's not just intellectual. The Westminster Shorter Catechism basically is just an exposition of three things. It's an exposition of the Apostles' Creed. It's an exposition of the Ten Commandments, and it's an exposition of the Lord's Prayer. Those are the three foundations of our faith. They inform what we believe about God, how God calls us to live, and how we're to pray, how, we're to, how we are to commune with God. What can be more practical? <laughs> In this uh, catechism, so we'll go through what we believe about God. 
the duty that God requires of us as his people and his moral law and the Ten Commandments. It gets very practical. It gets very into your life. And then it teaches us how to pray at the very end. So it's, this is going to be in a, in a very practical study for us. That's the goal. The goal of this catechesis is laying the foundation. Mike, you're a builder. You build houses, right? Do houses need foundations? You need a foundation to be able to lay all of the stuff that comes about. If you don't have a foundation, you don't have a house. Catechizing is laying the foundation. As a tree needs deep roots and a house needs a deep foundation to be settled and grounded, that's what we need as Christians. And so the goal of catechizing, of going through this with, as adults, hopefully with our children as well, is to provide that foundation. We're going through a children's catechism with Benjamin, and he loves it. He particularly loves the question that we ask him, is there more than one true God? And he shakes his head and he says, no, there's only one true God. And it just gets me emotional thinking about it. Something small like that, the most important truths that a three and a half year old can grasp. And they're useful for him. My prayer is that God would use those truths to provide a foundation that 20 years from now, when some wackadoo is, is trying to tell him something about what it means to follow God and what it means to, to, to go in this other direction, this other religion, he's going to remember that no, there's only one true God. And that one true God exists in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that one true God has revealed himself to us in the person and work of Jesus Christ, who was our Redeemer, the only Redeemer of God's elect. That's my prayer for him. That's my prayer for us as a church family, that we would be founded in God's word and that this catechism would be a great help to us. We're going to go through it, Lord willing, in, uh, in 11 weeks. This is week one. Week one was an overview. But hopefully in the next 11 weeks, we're going to go through all 108 questions. They divide up pretty nicely. We're not going to go through every single one, one by one, but we're going to deal with them in chunks to help you understand them, to help us understand them, to inform our prayers, to inform our lives. Uh, the next, hopefully the next one's going to be more interactive than this one was. But that's what I'll leave you with. We're trying to build the foundation here of our faith. This here is just a picture, maybe a generation or two after the Westminster Assembly of a preacher here. They used to do this on Sunday afternoons. They didn't have football games on Sunday afternoons. Can you imagine that? Here's what they used to do on Sunday afternoons. The preacher would come to people's houses and he'd work through the catechism with them. Can you imagine if I did that? <laughs> I'm coming over to your house. We're going through the catechism. Just an interesting picture of what it looks like 400 years ago to be a Christian. But I'm excited about this study. Uh, take one of these with you. Um, and we will uh, next week we'll be going through about the first 10 questions or so. And I'll give us more information on that uh, by the, the uh, email this week. But can I pray for us? Father, thank you for this study. Thank you for the gift of your word, which again we have seen does not return to you void, but accomplishes the purpose for which you sent it. Would you build on us, Lord, that deep foundation? Would you give us deep roots? Would you help us to see Christ for all that he is in your word? And would you use this study for your glory? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.